All right, let's get the show on the road. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending where you are in the world. Uh, live from Toronto, Canada, I'm Paul Briscoe. I'm Chief Architect at TAG, uh, and it's my privilege and pleasure to work with these people, an amazing team building some amazing software uh, for media processing. One of our favorite things in the world is OTT television, and so we have a little three-part series, this being part one, uh, looking into OTT, uh, covering it sort of from a ground-level understanding up. If you already know lots about it, today's session will probably disappoint you. Uh, please don't send me any corrections in the chat. Um, but if you don't know a lot about OTT, hopefully this is the first of three pieces of information that will give you a good understanding of what it's all about, how it works, and where to go looking for more information. Um, we have a little bit of housekeeping to attend to here. Um, I have my producer, director, and all-around handler, Dana, in Tel Aviv, a third of a planet away from me, uh, curating questions from the chat box. So if you put questions into the chat box at the end, uh, she will be curating and sending them to me, and we'll answer as many as we can here on air. And for the remainder, and in fact all the questions we answer on air, we will be uh, preparing an email with all of the questions and answers in it. So what is OTT? Well, it's a whole new method for distribution of TV and movie content. It goes over the top of existing and legacy distribution of all kinds, hence its name. Uh, it provides access to a huge array of free and paid content. It's geographically diverse. It's regionally or, or even down to your address aware. It opens the door to do advertising opportunities, one of the ways we monetize our industry. It brings new content sources to the table. It can deliver to any consumption experience, a phone, a tablet, or a giant TV equally. And it uses the internet and the cloud, which is really an important aspect of the whole thing. So why do we need a new broadcast technology? What's wrong with what we do? Well, here we're going to blame the internet. Um, legacy technologies no longer do what consumers expect them to do. Um, they're also bespoke technologies. They're specialized. They've always been designed for purpose. And up to this point in time, they are unique to our industries. The internet isn't that way. So the internet can offer resources to us on which we can build services without having to reinvent a lot of wheels. Um, another reason for the internet bl being blamed here is consumers want choice. The internet has given people choice. You can go clicking on things and have all the choice you want of the internet. And this has become a thing. And people expect this. And this not only applies to content, it applies to providers. People want to be able to choose and not be stuck with a provider and their library of content. Another reason to blame the internet is software. Everything today is software. It evolves in real time. It moves quickly. And what we did five years ago isn't necessarily relevant anymore. Hardware doesn't do this. Why over the top? Well, let's blame the internet as well. The internet touches most consumers today. In the future, it'll touch even more. There, there may come a day where the internet touches every human on earth. It has global reach. It provides a rich set of network services, all sorts of capabilities on which we can build applications. It today has the kind of speed we need, and this is from a guy who remembers in school using a 300 baud acoustic coupler um, to connect to a mainframe. And I can tell you the speed of connectivity has gone up over time. It continues to go up and speed is no longer an issue, and it certainly will not be in the future. It's highly flexible. The Internet is dynamic. It's intended to be flexible. It's intended to be a tool set, not a solution. On it, It's a something on which you can build a solution, and that's what we do here. Another important reason we, we value the Internet here is cloud computing. This is a whole new technology of virtual computing in the sky, or wherever the heck it is, a data center somewhere, but it's not yours. It's not your brick and mortar, and this is also key to OTT. The end of purpose-built facilities is actually very close to us. Uh, John Honeycutt from Discovery has a wonderful quote. Infrastructure used to be an asset. Now it's a liability. And this is true. People don't want to build rooms full of racks in brick-and-mortar buildings anymore if they don't have to. They want to do it in an OPEX model. Legacy distributions are infrastructure-centric and mostly hardware-based. Trying to cantilever this stuff to new requirements isn't really progress. It's trying to extend the life of something that really should be evolved. We need technology that looks way beyond today, and we need something that's infrastructure agnostic, something that isn't dependent upon a very specific kind of infrastructure other than a generic one in which to work. So what we need to do is take what we do today, get the best of breed out of it, all the stuff we need to keep doing our business, 
all the pieces that are useful and move forward with it. So what problems are we solving? Well, we're going to try and meet these new consumer expectations, this choice of content. Another very important one that both the internet and modern generations have really landed on is the time and method of consumption. I grew up in a time when you watched TV shows at a certain time on a certain channel and you watched it on your TV set. Well, that's not a thing anymore. People want to watch what they want to watch, when they want to watch it, where they want to watch it, on the device they want to watch it. Huge expectation change. There's also the expectation of being adaptive and, and dealing with all the modern formats, 4K, 8K. Heck, you can buy a phone now with 8K camera in it, HDR flavors, audio flavors, and these will continue. These will not stop, and consumers expect the latest technology to be in their hands. Legacy systems are more and more insufficient for meeting these requirements. And software, not hardware, rules the future. Another problem we're solving is dealing with the changing of the guard. The legacy industries that have gotten us to this point are graying, and younger people are coming to the, the, the fore, and they don't know what they can't do, and they don't know how they can't do it. And guess what? They figure out how to do it in way different ways. The biggest problem we're solving is ignoring the internet to this point. So OTT does exactly not that. Television today? Well, the old far side concept became the standard TV broadcast model for decades. That's the whole idea that at 7 p.m. it's this show and at 8 p.m. it's that show. It's scheduled programming with around 30% of in-line advertising. Somewhere between 25 and 30% of your show is advertising. We know it as bio breaks because that's been cultured into us as well, but I can remember jingles from a childhood from TV commercials, and that's kind of pathetic. Um, it's mostly short content on TV, less than an hour, occasionally longer shows, but it's typically short, And but it's one-way broadcasting. It's hardware-centric, it's a transmitter on a hill or a cable TV plant or something like that, and it's delivering this stuff to you in one direction. You can't talk back, you can't interact. We do have some consumer electronics innovations that have helped along the way. Things like VCRs, they came and went. DVDs, PVRs came and went. HDTV was driven by the consumer electronics industry, as uh, 4K is being today. Um, but our production workflows we've used and our technologies within them are fairly static. And this has defined generations of TV consumers. And this isn't a bad thing. So in the beginning, here's the model. This was the post-war model in 1945, you have a transmitter and people have TV sets and they send a picture from their giant tower uh, to your TV set. Very straightforward. You watch what they want you to watch at the time they want you to watch it. And if you don't like that channel, well, of course, there's more channels out there. And over time, channels sprung up and you could turn the channel knob and get different content. Different shows at different time, but still somebody else's choice of content at the time they want you to watch it. And you're still stuck in front of that TV set. Cable TV came along. This revolutionized content choice. Over the years, stations could be aggregated in a cable head end. They could be created into a channel bouquet, and that channel bouquet was distributed through a coax tree, ultimately to your set, to a set-top box, because there's so many channels, you needed something to select them on. And we arrived in the set-top box era, the multi-channel choice era. Content exploded. And then this grew on its own as well, because... We have networks delivered by satellite where cable companies could share content across their regions, where television networks could contribute content, and where all of this could be aggregated to provide an even richer service to consumers. And then along came something called direct to home, a third way to get to the consumer. There's a satellite. Everybody has a little KU band receiver, little KU band dish at home with another different set-top box. The satellite covers some regional span of the planet. And what they do is they aggregate all of this stuff as well. Network feeds, uh, TV stations that were previously in cable systems, those same things now come over direct to home. And direct to home and cable are now becoming very, very similar in terms of their content and their subscription models. But the most interesting thing happened when DTH came along because all of a sudden, content libraries became a thing. In addition to all of the live stuff coming in, in addition to all the programming available, a content library was made available to consumers. So you could, on your set-top box, pick something to watch and go ahead and watch it. Now this required an internet return fee to transact the purchase. The beginning of interactivity, right? Now just to discuss the robustness of this infrastructure, this all started out as analog. 
and over time, one piece at a time, went digital. Uh, digital cable was the first one to go. Uh, TV broadcasting followed fairly soon with DVB and ATSC standards. And of course, direct home satellite was always digital. So we have had an evolution of technology without changing our infrastructure or our methods, but it's worked very, very well. Until recent times, this has been a fabulous technical solution. It has been cantilevered HD. It's being cantilevered to 4K. But it's still not meeting the breadth of consumer demands. One thing it's definitely not meeting is this demand here. You can't watch it on anything but a TV set. So if you have a browser, if you have a tablet, if you have a phone, this kind of television isn't for you. This is a simplified view from Major League Baseball. It's a really nice way just to understand the situation. With regular broadcasting or with over the top, you can see the green check mark showing the things that are the same. So what's different? Well, the broadcaster and the cable distributor of your is now online. The internet has gone away to replace those two prior infrastructures. So today our characteristics of TV, scheduled programming, a whole bunch of inline advertising, short content, one way, slow incremental evolution, helpful innovations from the consumer electronics business, forced consumption environments, and in fact political alignment has come up over the years as well. You know what the flavor of each network is. This is something that hasn't really evolved yet in OTT. Now we have a technological gap. There is a solitude of the media arts, I will call it, and that's cinema and television. They, they, they used to be very, very different, right? The core technology is entirely different. Film was, it's called film because it's film. TV is electronic. Uh, the production technologies, well, film was processed chemically. It was cut physically. It's printed and so on versus electronic production technologies in TV. Uh, the production workflows, same thing. Film versus TV, very, very different workflows in the past. Consumption locations, still fixed, theater versus home. The quality, high in film, lower in TV, although when HDTV came along, that all became debatable. HDTV is only a few pixels short of 2K cinema, right? Um, the content, cinemas are long tail content, TV is mixed and short content. Advertising, not so much, although the environment of the theater gave you a ton of advertising. In TV, it's 25, 30 plus percent of advertising. The costing, well, per instance, to watch a movie versus a free or a subscription model in OTA cable and SAT. But we're seeing today emerging of the media arts. We've seen this coming now for a couple of decades, but really most recently it's accelerated. TV and cinema are very similar. The core technologies are both electronic and both software based. The production technologies have moved to electronic and software on both sides. Production workflows, we now find emerging of the best of breed techniques from both industries. We see film production techniques being used uh, in, in television. We see um, television editing being used in film. Consumption locations, well, more than ever before, but still not enough. The quality is no longer an issue. The content's ubiquitous. Content is now everywhere. We can get movies on TV. Uh, advertising, well, that varies right now by means of carriage, but advertising is still covered, and the cost of, is now really quite commensurate with the content value model. So then what's OTT? Just to resummarize, it's a method of distribution of TV and movie content. It goes over the top of all our legacy stuff. It gives consumer access to a wide array of content sources. Free, pay-as-you-go, and subscription. It's geographically diverse and it's regionally aware. And it brings new advertising opportunities by using the internet, the software, and the cloud. Ah, oh, we haven't talked about the cloud yet. We'll get there. So we have a changing media landscape, right? TV's gone across a whole bunch of generations, but the internet has created these new social constructs. And some of these are interestingly weird. Advertising is evil. Talk to a young person about what they think about advertising. The stuff that pops up on your browser or the stuff you get on TV, and you'll find that it's not the most popular thing in the world because of its lack of relevance sometimes, its pervasiveness, and so on. Um, we also see commodification of video. YouTube was the, the thing that started to change that. Uh, you can take your phone, you can go and shoot a movie, you can come home and edit it on your phone or on your computer and make top-notch quality. First run quality, right? It used to be magical and secret in the back room of TV and film studios, but no longer. Everything today is interactive. Interactivity is expected as, as part of every media experience. And, of course, today's television and cinema doesn't provide that. Even simple interactivity like pressing pause so you can have a bio break. This whole idea of anywhere, anytime, any device consumption is an expectation. This is something people want. Consumers want that. It's being driven by a much younger demographic. Why the internet? 
Well, it's a communications commodity, right? It's got the bandwidth, it's got the reach, it's got rich services and capabilities. No one owns it particularly. I mean, uh, somebody owns every piece of it. But at the end of the day, when you buy yourself a contract with your ISP, you're paying your piece of owning the internet, and it's there. It's agnostic to video and audio formats. It doesn't care what we do. In fact, it, it doesn't give a darn about our industries. It's all just packets to the internet. So if we can use those packets and services effectively, all the better. And there's a huge number of consumer device types available. Your phone, your tablet, your laptop, your TV set, and, there, and there's more coming. A wristwatch, a brain implant, sit tight. Um, it's very robust. It's multi-technology based. It's highly robust and redundant, in fact. It's continuously evolving. And again, cloud computing, I mentioned this, it lives there. We'll have to talk about cloud computing sometime. But it's, it's not quite that simple, right? We look at what we expect today. Broadcasting requires determinism. Right now, broadcasting distribution is through protected private content highways where they're tightly managed. They're highly secure. We push that content to consumers. We just push it at them. There's no interaction. If you want that content, it's coming and you receive it. The latency is typically fairly low. It's just been inherent in our systems. Is it actually important? Well, that's another discussion. We have to adhere to standards, rigid normative standards for media formats, for transmission formats, and in many cases over the air regulations as well. The, the internet's not natively good at these sort of things. So we do need some new technologies to accommodate these. We need to come up with delivery determinism. We need to come up with internet-friendly mechanisms for transport. And pushing doesn't work on the internet. The stuff on the internet is pulled. When you go to a web page, you go click, you're pulling content. You're requesting it to give you content, but you're doing the pulling from your browser, and that's the technology we have to look at using. Latency, well, when and why does latency matter? It's going to be a challenge to achieve low latency on the internet, but we need to ask ourselves when's it important, when's it not, and how do we handle that? We do have some rigid standards, of course. Um, and we have new evolving standards. We also have some sort of non-standards because the internet isn't driven by hard, normatively derived ISO compliant standards. The internet's actually defined by a bunch of documents called re request for comment. Now, they aren't really just a request for comment. They're the result of those comments. And when they finally distill down to something robust and they're peer reviewed, that becomes a standard to run the internet. Who'd have ever thought there's no huge number of ISO standards running the internet? Everything software based. We need to use software. We need to be able to have this resident in the cloud. And we need software-based consumption platforms because there's no use in having flexibility at one end of the system if you don't have flexibility at the other, other. Software in both ends is key. Internet is very, very good with this sort of thing. So these new requirements, well, screens. This is interesting. There's many, many new image resolutions. What's the pixel resolution of your phone? I mean, you, you can tell me your TV set is, is 1920 by 1080. Can you tell me your pixel resolution on your phone? I, some people know it, most don't, and most don't care. The point being, if I'm delivering OTT to a 4K screen, I gotta send a lot of pixels to achieve the quality. If I'm sending it to your little phone screen, I don't have to send as many pixels. But that's probably not gonna be a standard broadcast format. What will be standard is 16 by nine. Something else people want, of course, is just what you expect like you have in music. You want device handover. You're watching it on your tablet. You go upstairs. You press pause. You turn on the TV. You press unpause. You want handover. You want pause and rewind and fast forward and park, maybe record. You want to deliver targeted advertising. If you have to deliver advertising, make it regional, make it local, make it personal, make it relevant. This is important to people. They'll pay attention to relevant advertising. And we have to be able to handle technically present and future compression formats. So what can we reuse? Well, MPEG transport stream is a robust carrier. It's self-describing and self-synchronizing. It's a useful thing. That's something we can take advantage of going forward. Of course, our video image formats, resolutions, frame rates, color volumes, these are all useful. We can take those forward. They're supported already in consumer devices. We can use and build on those. Our video compressions, same thing. We have some good ones today. MPEG 2s, a little old, but it works really well, MPEG-4 HEVC, and there are many, many more coming with higher efficiency and better performance. Same with audio. We have audio formats and compression. We can reuse this stuff. We need to reuse this stuff to have continuity of our business. So how does internet OTT transport work? Well, in a nutshell, which we'll get into a little, we'll crack this nut and get deeper on the next session. Uh, it uses TCP IP. TCP, the Transport Control Protocol, is a almost guaranteed delivery service in that if a packet is lost, it's retransmitted. 
I say almost air, almost lossless because if you cut the wire, well, it's going to try and retransmit that packet and never succeed. But under normal circumstances, and in normal internet operation, by the way, packets are pouring on the floor of data centers all over the world all day, every day. But TCP takes care of the problem. So we need guaranteed delivery. That, unfortunately, introduces latency, and this is where the fun starts. Um, the content gets pulled by end devices, not pushed from the top. This very web-centric model, when you watch content using OTT, you are making a request, and then your browser starts to pull the content to you or your device that you're playing. It's based on file transfer of chunks of media. It's no longer a continuous stream. It's files. It's chunks. These chunks, when you put them together, forms that same stream, but we're transferring files, something the internet is very comfortable with. There's multiple versions of the content made available. I talked about the sending resolution for your phone and resolution for your TV. So OTT allows multiple resolutions of content to be transmitted simultaneously. And then the player picks the one that's most appropriate. And the player can also switch the version dynamically. We can also, with OTT, insert ads at any point in the path, all the way from the head end, down through the distribution, right into your player. And your player can play you an ad that was targeted just to you, probably maybe even knows your name. So the OTT transmission quite simply looks like this. We take related streams of media, we'll call a program, it's video, it's audio, it's metadata, all the stuff we push down the hose today, and we take 10 seconds of that and we make a file called a chunk file. That file represents 10 seconds of video, audio, metadata. The next chunk file represents the next 10 seconds. And what we do with this file then is we render it to these different resolutions and make other chunk files. So we end up, if we had five levels of resolution, we would make five chunk files. This is the adaptive bitrate ABR part of ODT. And then we create a file that describes those chunks. So we have these five chunks representing 10 seconds of video, audio, of metadata, and we create a file that describes them. It's called the manifest. And it also contains a recent chunk history and other metadata because the player may have to know about prior chunks and so on. And then we post all of that onto a server and then we do it again. And that's all transmission does. It's a continuous posting of these chunks of files, these groups of chunk files onto a server over and over and over. The way it's received is really quite simple. The player contacts the server. There's probably authentication required. There's quite possibly uh, encryption that has to be established, authenticated, and set up. And ultimately, the user gets to a program guide, and they navigate a list, and they pick something to view, and they click the button. The player goes and pulls the current manifest file, the latest manifest file it can find. Now, the player knows something about its resolution. It knows something about its available bandwidth to the Internet. So it can pick what it wants to watch. It can decide which rendition to look at. So it then pulls that chunk, and only that chunk, and it plays it. And so it plays out that chunk, and when a new manifest comes available, it goes and pulls that manifest, and then it selects the chunk it wants again. If the bandwidth has changed, it'll select a higher or lower chunk, and then it'll seamlessly play that chunk immediately after the end of the first chunk. And then this process repeats itself. It's just rinse and repeat. It's a super simple method. It's not particularly intuitive in terms of streaming, but if you look at what goes in one end and what comes out the other, it's still a stream technology. It's still moving, living, real-time video. Now, there's adaptation magic, right? Which stream does the player choose? Well, there's the user side impact of available bandwidth and display and use. The audio, not so much, but the display is the big one. So during playout at every chunk boundary, when bandwidth changes, it can pick a different chunk. So the red arrow line is your large TV screen. You got good solid bandwidth. You just play the highest quality chunk the whole time, the 1920 by 1080 HEVC. If you're watching that and your kids are playing a game and your wife's watching a movie and some other internet stuff's going on, your bandwidth goes up and down, you can see by the third 10 second block, the bandwidth's gotten bad. So we're going to switch to a lower quality chunk. Now, you're watching a big screen and we're switching to a lower quality. Is that good or bad? What's the option? The option is we freeze the video and show you a little spinny disk that says buffering. So we can switch to a slightly lower quality, probably not impact the viewing experience significantly, but guarantee continuity of play. When the bandwidth recovers, we can go back to the full res picture. If you start out in the blue line and you're on your tablet and you're walking around out in the wild, you may start with the medium content, the 1287-20 rendition, but bandwidth may go really bad on you because of all the people on the local cell. Next thing you know, you've switched down. 
same technique. So you can move between resolutions to accommodate changes in bandwidth. And this is one of the magical tricks of OTT. Now, we have some new players in this space, which makes it very interesting. We have new VOD providers, people with large libraries of content. Um, I'll call out Netflix because they were just one of the first. They're big. Uh, they're very engaged at developing this technology. And they have a huge library of content. They also have media player apps. So when you run their app, the security is buried inside. It takes care of everything. And the monetization model they use, in fact, is just a, a subscription model. The interesting thing is some VOD providers are becoming content creators. Uh, 20 years ago, if you told me that, you know, uh, uh, an MVPD was going to become a film studio, I'd have looked quizzically at you. But Netflix is a huge production house. They do Hollywood-level films, Amazon, and so on. So this is a real new change to the industry. We have new content creators who already have a distribution service and a library. And we see other people with content. Disney, for example, they have a huge content library. They're coming to the table with their content and putting up an OTT service. These people were not known as TV distributors before. But that's what they're doing today. And finally, the broadcasters are coming on board. Broadcasters, networks first, and local stations probably to follow are coming on board with streaming channels, live TV. And these other providers as well are looking to now distribute live as OTT as well because it works just fine. So the networks are starting. Local stations may follow, uh, depending. It's, uh, for some reason, I don't understand. The uptake on that's been very slow. But we'll also quite possibly see new internet-only broadcasters. We already have podcasting broadcasters. We'll see TV broadcasters. And I don't mean low-quality crappy ones. I mean really good ones. Um, providing internet-only networks and stations for OTT content viewing. So, in summary, the OTT is it's the new big thing. It works really well. If anybody, well, I think probably everybody watching this uh, has, has used it. If you've watched a YouTube video, it's, it's OTT. Uh, it's complicated. Technically, it's not quite the same as a stream, um, but that's okay because the internet's complicated too, and that's all abstracted away from you by software. Uh, there's numerous flavors of OTT. We'll get into that in the next section because it's not straightforward, and just like everything in the industry, there's no single way to do things anymore. But it can accommodate live, it can accommodate VOD, SVOD, and so on, and it can accommodate most any player platform if it's a software-based player platform. And the important thing here is it's cloud-friendly and cloud-native. And I didn't say a word about the cloud all this way, and I'm going to leave it like that, because next time around we're going to talk deeply about the cloud as we look into the guts of OTT. Uh, this is definitely, however, the future of media consumption distribution, at least for the foreseeable, uh, foreseeable path forward. There are three chapters to this. Uh, you're watching the March 3rd Understanding one. Uh, April 6th, we'll be going Technically Speaking, and May 5th, we'll be looking at the business uh, of OTT. Uh, so I hope you'll join us for those two follow-up sessions. Uh, as well, we have a series on the cloud. Uh, cloud 101 is a multi-part series, and you can replay the first session, uh, which just happened, I think, last week, and register for the rest uh, on our website at www.tagvs.com. And with that, I'm going to leave it here. Uh, we do have a few questions already. Dana has sent me a few here. Let me look at the screen. And let's just, uh, let's get a few out of the way. I don't want to go way over time here. But first question, what about 8K and beyond over the internet? Will it still work? That's a good question. Um, so it's dependent upon a bunch of things. You know, it's end-to-end -end bandwidth, which doesn't just mean the internet backbone. It means the drop on your end. It means the bandwidth at the high end. Um, and it's a function of video compression. So the combination of compression and bandwidth are what will enable 8K. Uh, will it work? Well, today it's probably a little bit dodgy. Uh, will it work in the not too distant future? Uh, I would I would venture to say absolutely yes. Um, the consumer electronics uh, uh, people of the world are going to push 8K forward when they run out of people to sell 4K panels to, and we'll have to respond to that. Or it'll be like today, where broadcasters aren't delivering 4K content in North America, but the internet is, so people are buying 4K TVs. Um, how can you handle future compression formats? Oh, what an excellent question. I'm glad somebody asked that. Because I'm way out on a limb here saying, yeah, we're going to support things we don't know yet. Well, the way we do that is through software. And I'm sorry to be glib about it, but it really is the way things are. If we can define it, we can write code to do it. Uh, will software be fast enough? Well, it just keeps getting faster. 
Um, everybody's familiar with Moore's Law and the other things that uh, make, make things get faster and faster over time. So uh, absolutely, we can handle future compression formats because they'll be written in software. They'll be software-based. And everything from the system from end to end is software. So absolutely, we'll be able to handle formats that haven't been invented yet. I think I can say that with reasonable confidence. Uh, do you think the current OTT players will consolidate into a very few major players, leaving no room for competition? Oh, this is a question. This is a good question for the third session. Um, that's really hard to say. Consolidation is so hard to predict. There's so many factors that drive that. Um, we may see some of the legacy distributors consolidating as they move into OTT for mass uh, against some of the existing uh, uh, VOD players out there. It's really hard to say. If consolidations do occur, what they do is they open up gaps in the market for new entrants, right? So uh, whether there's consolidation at a higher or low rate, I think it is just part of the evolution of the market and uh, it'll remain to be seen what happens. I do not think there will be a big brother of media ever. Um, there will always be alternate. This is art we're talking about. Don't forget, this is the technology of art. So there will always be alternate art. So, you know, if everybody turns into one big company, there's going to be other people out there waiting to fill in the, the, the vacuums that were left. Um, let's do one more. Uh, how long will current broadcasting methods hang on? Will OTT replace them all? Oh, broadcasting is not going anywhere. Not in a hurry. Uh, it is on decline. Um, I know they've been seeing in, in um, MVPDs, uh, the broadcasters have been seeing viewership and revenue dropping um, at a rate that is less than the rate of growth of OTT. But I think they've got fairly long legs. I think it'll be quite some time uh, before those go away. So I don't think there's any, any concern that that's, uh, that market is going to completely evaporate and disappear. But I think we will see OTT take up more and more and internet-based uh, distribution technologies will uh, probably drive the future. Uh, we've got some more questions, but I'm going to draw a line here because I've been talking at you long enough and you're probably getting pretty tired of me. So I'd like to thank you for joining us. Uh, I really appreciate your time. Again, we know it's, uh, it's valuable to you and it's valuable to us if you give us your ears. So thank you. Um, there's my email on the screen. If you want to drop me a line about any technical subject or anything for that matter, feel free to write. I'm always happy to correspond. And uh, I look forward to seeing you uh, next time. We hope you'll join us. That's it from me. Have a great day. Thank you so much for being here.